Yeah, I'm Richard, uh, Linux distribution engineer at SUSE, which is like the most generic job title anywhere. It's like, you know, human at planet Earth. Um, and yeah, I'm going to be talking about some of the, the stuff. I'm, well, I'm not going to be talking about a distribution for like my first time at Foxtem ever. Instead, I'm talking about a nice library living underneath. But starting with that, who is responsible for the, for the configuration of a machine once it's deployed? You know. <laughs> not Leonard Pottering, although, you know, if you want to point fingers, you can, you know. You know, is it the distribution? Is it the upstream, um, who actually don't get a mention here, um, or, or is, is it the user? Um, you know, from speaking from a distribution perspective, you know, I, I honestly believe, you know, distributions have a hand in making sure the configuration of the operating system, once it's deployed, you know, is right and sensible. You know, we, we should be making sure the defaults are sensible, a good out of the Xbox experience, you know, secure, you know, whatever sensible means, really. I mean, it's, you know, open to interpretation. Different distributions have different interpretations. Um, and of course, different upstreams have different interpretations, too. Um, and, you know, sometimes we don't agree with what upstream have decided are the defaults. Um, but also, upstreams always do interesting new stuff. And that interesting new stuff often requires new configuration parameters to be set or, you know, the, def the sensible defaults change. And somehow we need to get that to our users. But at the same time, you know, some users believe Linux is about choice, or at least there's definitely the, the choice they have to, you know, potentially ruin their system. You know, and they want to configure their configuration the way they want it. Um, and that means, you know, potentially having unsensible choices, or at least, you know, weird ones that make no sense to us. Um, and they're not necessarily going to be paying attention to all of the stuff going on in the distribution, in those upstreams. So they're not necessarily going to know that this default needs changing. This new feature has some nice new flag, you know, just like the, the system D talk we knew, you know, we just had with all those wonderful different flags you can put into your system D unit files. You know, that, you know, right now, if for a lot of services, a lot of demons, you know, that's a bit of a minefield. <coughs> And sort of the typical classical problem is, you know, distributions put a, got a package. We've got some service called foo. There's a config file in etc. The user edits that and sets it up the way they like it. And then a new version of foo comes along and we want to change the, you know, we want to change the defaults. We want to introduce the new parameters. You know, or we, you know, there's been some horrific CVE and we desperately have to make sure that there isn't that setting set by default. And whatever happens, there's some, you know, horrific or semi-horrific explosion. There is no perfect solution to this problem at the moment, no matter how we look at it. You know, you can notify users on wikis and stuff, but they don't read it and it doesn't work. You know, or if you try and find a technical solution, you know, most of us as packages try something like some fancy postscript where we're, you know, editing with said and just praying we've got our regular expressions right. And then we get it wrong, and the users scream and file bugs, saying the distro broke our config. Um, more conservatively, you know, certain packaging tools, are, you know, especially RPM and sort of Arch, you know, we have these sort of you know, nice helpers where you know we can, in the packaging tool, back up the user config, install our new user config, and you know, leave their old config as an RPM save file, and then the user doesn't bother noticing that, and they file a bug saying you know the distro broke our config. Um, or we flip it the other way around, and we're, we're paranoid and never touch the user's configuration, and we put our new settings in, in an RPM new file, and then nobody ever looks at it, and then they file a bug, and we just turn around and say, sorry, your setup isn't supported. Um, you know, it, it doesn't work at all at the moment. It, it's, it's the hell we've all been living doing distros for so long, and the hell's getting worse, um, because you know, there's this lovely new trend of, of atomic distributions like with OpenSUSE and MicroOS, where this problem gets even more complicated because like in, in MicroOS, we have a read-only root file system. You know, a user can't modify that root FS once it's there, but we want them to be able to modify ETC because, you know, they need to be able to change the settings. Um, so, but when we need some way of atomically delivering those new configuration settings that we need on there without messing around with their config. So, you know, it, it, yeah. It, it has all of the issues plus more because we, yeah, we can't just mess around on the root file system like we used to. And 
when we were dealing with some of these issues that cropped up with what we're doing in MicroOS, you know, we realized there's, there's one really configuration-heavy service sitting on all of our MicroOS machines, which doesn't give us any problems at all, and it's wonderful, and life is great, and it's System D. Um, which kind of shocked me a little bit when I realized it, but yeah, you know, System D solves this problem really, really nicely. You know, it has this lovely structure of everything's a unit file, and those unit files live in one of two places. You know, the distribution config is meant to live in USR lib system D system, and that's where all your unit files live, your timers, your services, blah, 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 blah. And then for your user config, every change they make is in etc system D system, and you know, the two worlds are separated, and we don't have to worry about that. You know, we don't touch etc system D system, we just touch USR, and all is good. It gets even better because with system D services, you also have this concept of drop ins. Well, on like a per service basis, you get a, you know, foo.service.d folder, and you can put little drop in configuration files in there. Those drop in configuration files can individually uh, override individual lines or parameters of the, the other config file elsewhere. So, you know, and it's, even that is layered, so you can have, you know, USR drop-ins and ETC drop-ins, and System D figures out what the right priority is and applies the right one, which is like what we're using with, like, Kubernetes now. You know, you've, you've got, you know, container runtimes and Kubernetes and all these other distro-dependent stuff, and they all want to modify each other's services. So, US, you know, in, our, in OpenSUSE, Cubic at least, you know, our USR lib drop-ins, you know, we have drop-ins after drop-ins after drop-ins, and then users can put their own drop-ins in, and then you eventually get the right config at the end. So it, it's great when you've got this sort of multiple layering. Um, and we realized, well, this is cool for, you know, system D services. Why can't we do it for, like, everything else? Um, which, of course, you know, is going to need some work, so let's try and make it easy for people. Um, and so uh, Pascal, uh, an apprentice at, at uh, SUSE, Last year, this like this entire project is like not even a year old. Um, uh, yes, yeah, st basically started writing a C library to kind of first as an experiment to see you know can we even do this, and then like all good experiments, it's got completely out of hand. Um, for basically providing to anybody using this library API calls and functions to be able to int be able to do the same kind of configuration layer in their services in their applications. Um, it's an MIT license, so you can use it for everything. And the two main use cases are literally, you know, both layering sort of a, an entire config file, like the typical system D service thing of USR versus ETC, or if you really want to be fancy, doing sort of foo.d and, and yeah, drop-ins and, and layering those two things on top of each other. Like I said, not even a year old, so it's not even a, this is its first FOSS demo it could ever be at, because it was 26th of April last year we started it. Um, and, but yeah, we're, we're using it in plenty of places. It's not magic, you know. Start with start with the negatives. You know, you you need to modify software to have libeconf support. It, you know, we're not magically taking over other bits of services. And in its current form, it only supports sort of any style configuration files where you know you've got a group, you've got a key with a value, you've got another key with a value. Um, it's flexible in the sense of you know you can have whatever delimiter and white spaces you you want. Um, but you know, we, at the moment, we're only working with these kind of configuration files, which which form this structure. I'm not going to give like detailed code examples, um, and you know, the API list is getting longer and longer. But at its core, there's sort of eight or so core API calls which kind of do all of the work. You know, Econf read file reads a configuration file, takes all those key values, and you know, dumps them in a, a key file for you know, use elsewhere in your application. Reader basically does that, so but for multiple configuration files in a directory. So you know that's what you would use for the kind of foo.service.d equivalent. There's a f function for enumerating the groups in there, which you know can be handy when you're looking for that one config file nested, in, the one config nested in one group somewhere down the line. Get the keys, and then we have a whole bunch of get value of various types, so you can you know grab your strings and make sure it's all type same. You know grab grab your write along int and yeah, get the, the correct value of the correct type you expect as you go along. Um, that's all the reading on the writing side of things. Thanks. 
Um, we've got a bunch of setters for doing the same in reverse. So you can yeah, set your configuration back in there. We've got a, a tool for merging files. So you can literally just yeah, two straight files, merge everything together, job done. And all of those a API calls are, are stable, versioned. You know, we're not going to break them at all. Yeah, that's, we promise. Write file, on the other hand, for writing out this to a configuration file. We've got people using it, but it's, it's not yet stable. It, it's, it's, you know, because, you know, we're not entirely happy with how it's writing or handling things like the file already being open or already being edited. Um, but it's there if you want to write the file back out the disk. In OpenSUSE land, like I say, this has all kind of gone out of hand, but in a fun, exciting way. Um, OpenSUSE is moving towards using USR for all of its disk config. That's the goal. It's going to take years, but we're moving in that direction as fast as we can. So we want ETC to be considered user data and you know, treated with the same reverence and avoidance as slash home or slash SRV. You know, we don't want to be messing in our user's sandpit. That's, you know, ETC should be theirs. We don't want our packages touching it. We don't want our scripts touching it. We, we don't want to be responsible for breaking anything anymore. Um, so, you know, in the case of like system D, it's already using USR, but for the, the stuff that doesn't, we're now starting to use USR ETC and basically moving our configuration to there. Um, in the case of libconf, libconf doesn't care about these locations. It's all variables. So, you know, you could use it how you want to put it where you want. So this can handle, you know, user lib whatever or user etc whatever it doesn't matter but for us we're finding it's easier to move things along to that because it's you know a one-to-one -one mapping of user etc whatever to etc whatever makes makes the logic a bit simpler for us there's a number of examples where we've already got applications moving across to it uh, like pam pam upstream has lib ecomp support since three or four months ago i think now um so if in OpenSUSE we've already packaged up with this um, so user etc pamd has all of your pam configs, then user config can be an etc pamd, both get passed at runtime, and etc values always went nice, simple, done. Um, the same for shadow, also up, this is also upstream, which of course they're also using pam, so it also has their config in pamd, so it's fun that when they're all sharing the same thing and using the same library. But you've also got login defs, and I just realized a typo because that's meant to be user etc login defs. Um, but yeah, the login defs are stored there. etc login defs you know, can be overridden by users. The etc values always run. That's all done at runtime. And all of the util Linux stuff, this is not yet upstream. I think it's submitted, but there's some discussions about our patch. But we've patched it in OpenSUSE, so all of the to log in remote, etc. in OpenSUSE are using this and ex using it exactly the same way. Um, but there's exceptions. So Reboot Manager, which is the, the tool in microOS, which basically uh, detects when there is an update pending. Well, there has been an update applied and there is therefore a reboot pending and required to be done. That configuration is really simple. There's, there's like, it's one group, there's like four parameters. It, 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 it's, there's no point doing all this complicated nesting and layering. So in that case, you've just got a nice, simple, straightforward config file, and you can put another nice, simple, com straightforward config file in, in etc. And we just merge both of them at one time, and we, we use that unstable write file to just dump it in etc reboot manager conf. And so all the logic in the code for actually reading the configuration file hasn't changed at all. It's still reading the same config file, but yeah, libconf is doing a little bit of magic before that to, to move things along. Um, and yeah, we want as many other projects to start adopting this, using it in their own way. We haven't yet uh, done this where, you know, you must follow a certain sort of system D-like or, or you know, PAM-like approach, where you, know, you have to use the same config. You know, we, we realize upstreams have their own way of, you know, upstream applications have their way of doing configuration. We want to make this as easy as possible to fit in. So you've got the primitives here where you can take libconf, make our life easier and make your life easier, hopefully. But you don't have to rewrite your entire logic of, you know, how you're consuming your configuration in your application. Um, we are thinking of adding more high-level API calls for people who just want to make things even simpler for them in the long run. Uh, but before that, oh, we have some, yeah, concrete plans. You know, passing config files is hard, and, you know, our parser isn't perfect. 
Um, so I've been looking at, at using a, thanks, a, a much more established configuration file parser um, as, you know, instead of writing our own and constantly tweaking our own. Um, so Augeus is on our radar. Um, I have some patches that are roughly working, and, and you know, I'm slowly patching it into all of the API calls. Um, it does a very good job, technically speaking. You know, it's very, it's very reliable. It handles far more variations of configuration files than just innies. It also handles those innie files more gracefully, especially those weird ones with weird delimiters and weird white space rules and all that stuff. Yeah, Augeus has figured that all out already. The downside is, though, you know, it does make the dependency tree for, for LibbyConf, you know, a little bit heavier than just a nice, simple C library that you can plop on and put into everything. Um, and the code is getting a little bit more complex. So this, this isn't certain. I want to kind of, you know, get feedback from anyone here and see if there's any other options out there um, or help doing this, you know, if people think this is a great idea. Um, but, yeah, it's a sort of work in progress and the direction we'd like to go because we realize that just doing any files is, is somewhat limiting for this idea. Um, and Dominic, is Dominic here? Nope. Dominic, another one of our apprentices, he's working on uh, eConf tool, which is a, the, basically aimed to be sort of a generic helper tool for um, you know, the idea being, you know, an application started using libeconf. That now means you've got configuration files in USR, configuration files in etc. How does a user know what parameters are actually being applied, when, how? So eConf tool is sort of a generic helper of, you know, taking that default logic. You know, you, so, you know, like ideas like yeah, eConf tool pamd, what your config is pfft, done. You know, give a, give a list out there, and a bit like system CTO with like system CTO edit. You know, be able to edit the config and it'll put the right snippets in the right place and make your life a little bit easier. Um, this is just the beginning. If people like this idea, you know, there's obvious things we, you know, we could do to improve. Um, you know, the different file parser being, being the one that I already mentioned, but also language bindings. Not everything is written in C. Um, so, sadly, um, especially when it comes to Go. Um, but yes, if people want Go, if people want Python, if people want Rust, you know, this, you know, this needs to be something used in as many places as we can. You know, we're not just going to start here, yeah, stay here, but we can't do everything alone. So, you know, if you like this idea, you know, the code is open, it's MIT, contributions are welcome, changes are welcome, features are welcome, um, you know, please help, enjoy, start using it, start putting it in your distro. That's why I'm here, basically. Um, and with that, I think I've managed to squeeze this into to 20 minutes or so. So there is just a bit of time for questions at the end. Yes, sir. In the API, I saw uh, the first one you had was read config file, something like that. Yeah. Why is that singular read config file? Isn't there a whole idea that it reads all the files and all the drop it and does this, the magic behind the scene? Or yep. So, so, no, so why, why is the uh, read file just a read a singular file? Yeah, um, th That's because there are definitely cases where you just have one config file. For the cases where you have multiple in a directory, that's why we have the readers config, uh, the readers API call. And readers just, you know, reads a directory and read files all of the contents of that directory. So does the programmer of this uh, like econ, uh, have to go through, I understand that the idea is that the user Yep. And, and, uh, all this, and, uh, I would have expected all this ma uh, matching and merging uh, happens behind the scenes, or does the user of this e uh, LibEcon have to do that? The application developer who is patching LibEcon support into that application has to do that. So the user doesn't, but you know, libeconf is there to be you know, consumed. Yeah. So at the moment, yes, you know, we are planning on add adding you know higher level API calls, which you know have opinionated views on how you do that matching and merging, um, which will make their life easier. You know, that's you know. So, but at the moment, Yep. And there is under something under ETC pool, and I have to order the drop-ins and everything. I have to do that manually. Yeah, you have to do that manually. Yeah, but like the the reboot manager example is kind of like a nice simple one. You know, it's one config file, so you know the config file now lives in two places. You merge it. Done. It, it's yeah. You know, not everybody has complicated stuff like Pam. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Several 
That in in Haiku. Okay, yeah, we we will look at that. Thank you. Cool. Yep. Do you uh, handle uh, merge conflicts? Um, no, we do not handle merge conflicts. You know, so the moment with with the current calls we have, you know, the you know, you've got you know, with that merge files, for example, you know, you're declaring one is going to override the other. So you, you know, by by how you order it, and you know, there's no there's no magic there. Um, so for the more complicated stuff, you know, you could use those primitives to do fancy stuff with with handling merge conflicts, but. Is there a standardized and simple way to display all the, the config files? The there, there's no standardized and simple way of displaying the config, the, all the config files. You know, that's kind of what the uh, eConf CTL or eConf tool, sorry, we was called eConf CTL a week ago. Uh, eConf tool is, is looking at doing, is sort of giving us, giving us a sort of standard way of, of doing that. Yes? <laughs> Do you plan to <laughs> I have a feeling that, that it doesn't really make sense to port libconf uh, system D to use libconf. You know, they're doing it fine. But we wouldn't really have anything there. Yeah. Another question about system D. Uh, did you uh, release that code or? No, this is this is all completely fresh. No, no recent code. No. Sorry, but just repeat the question. The question was, yeah. It, um, uh, did we reuse any of system D's code with this? Chance encoding? Hmm? Ch chance encoding is UTF uh, binary? Uh, it's, is it UTF is binary? Uh, how, uh, at the moment it's just, it's just UTF, yeah. But it, it, it's, it's a bit basic at the moment. Sorry. Yeah, it's a bit naive at the moment. We admit that. Yeah. So Uh, most of them are in this slide. I think I might have missed one or two, but you know, this is kind of kind of where we are after a year. So, so the, the question was, how many upstreams have we patched? Um, so. Um, so the most of them have been like the. So the question was, what do they think? Um, most of it has been like surprisingly. Wow, this is cool. Great merge in done. Like like so, Util Linux has been like the only one where there's been sort of questions, feedback, like improvements, juggling around. The rest have been like, you know, here's the patch, fine, done. In, um, of course, in the case of Reboot Manager, you know, we are the upstream, so that che yeah, we cheated. But <laughs> yeah. Next question. Yes. In your Reboot Manager example, given that you write the merge configuration back to etc., yes. how would the distribution then shift the change to the default? Um, how would the distribution chip a change to the default in the case of like Reboot Manager where we're writing it out? Yeah, we wouldn't. Um, you know, it, it's you know, it's in the case of reboot manager because we're the upstream as well. We we know we're like n probably never going to do that, and if we do, like the config file is simple enough, so we'll still hack around it the old-fashioned way. Which you know, it's a, a rod for our own back. You know, we'll do it properly one time. Um, but in that, in that case, it's mainly for adding new configuration files because reboot manager is is you know. In a, in a kind of similar state of development, relatively new, moving relatively quickly. So they're just using LibreConf makes our life way easier for adding that new thing out to existing systems. Um, plus also with Reboot Manager being like a really, like that's definitely something where you don't want to mess with what the user's already decided. You know, they've got their policy for how they want their system rebooting and that, that like those core parameters are basically that right now. So the chances are, even if we change a default, we're not going to change the default time your system's booting. You've, you've picked it. You're running it. You know, it's, it's done, dusted. You would, you would hate us if you suddenly, your machine started rebooting at the wrong time. Do you program tooling like the distribution to move to, like, this system in the way, like, you compare what the distribution would provide, how the user modified, and then to move, like, the, only the diff to the user stuff and the system yeah. default? Yeah, so the question is, do we provide any uh, uh, any tooling to kind of help people move to this, uh, this approach? Um, we don't. Ecomp tool will do some of that for users because, you know, you'll, you'll have that there where Ecomp tool will be showing this is coming from the, the distro USR. This, this is what you've got in ETC. You know, so this is what the, the runtime use is. Um, we, we could look at, you know, adding that or working on that for making sort of the transition easier. Um, but we have found, because we're going through this, you know, every upstream app is, is different. You know, they've implemented their configuration differently. They're consuming it differently across their entire code base. And we're not trying to force everybody to doing 
everything exactly the same way, you know. So this is sort of trying to be that middle ground of it's flexible enough that you can patch it in so your config can be split and layered, but you don't have to, you know, don't have to do everything exactly the same way. Uh, time's up, I'm sorry, but I'll be outside so we can catch everyone later. Thank you very much.